Okay, hello everyone. Here we are with the new topic for today. Uh, we're still struggling with lipid metabolism, but this time we're going to move on from fatty acids to cholesterol. Uh, and we're going to discuss a little bit about the biosynthesis of cholesterol and about the catabolism of cholesterol, if there is any. We're going to see it in the upcoming couple of minutes. So uh, let's remind ourselves just briefly about the structure of cholesterol. So it belongs to the group of simple lipids. And if you remember, simple, simple lipids are molecules which cannot hydrolyze to produce more simple compounds. Speaking of the structure of cholesterol, it's considered an alicyclic compound with a very specific steron ring uh, composed of four condensed ring, three six-membered ring and one five-membered ring uh, forming the cyclopentanoperhydrophenone train ring, which is the basis of all steroid compounds and cholesterol as well. Speaking of the structure of cholesterol, it is very well known that cholesterol is a 27 carbon molecule and there are several characteristic groups attached to steron ring. So we have OH group, hydroxyl group at the position number three. We have double bond at the position number five. We have eight member hydrocarbon chain at carbon atom number 17 of steron ring. We had two methyl groups marked, marked as 18 and 19 uh, at the position number 10 and number 13. So uh, this is the structure of free cholesterol, but in our blood, uh, approximately one third of cholesterol is found in, the, in its free form, but uh, two thirds of cholesterol is found in the form of cholesterol esters, where, where OH group at position number three is esterified with some fatty acids. Esterification uh, is usually accomplished with the linoleic acid, but some other fatty acids uh, may be found in cholesterol esters. What are the functions of cholesterol? Uh, cholesterol is a molecule which is synthesized in almost all tissues. But of course, there are some uh, tissues uh, in which uh, cholesterol synthesis is uh, much more enhanced in comparison to some other tissues. So cholesterol is mostly synthesized in liver, which is number one, then in intestines, in adrenal cortex, in gonads, I mean ovaries and testicles, in placenta, because uh, the needs for cholesterol are going to be increased in those uh, tissues. We know very well uh, that cholesterol is one of the important integrative parts of cell membranes. Uh, we also know that cholesterol is a precursor in biosynthesis of all steroid hormones in our body. So cholesterol is converted to pregnenolone, and then pregnenolone is the uh, starting point for the biosynthesis of five classes of steroid hormones. Glucocorticoids like cortisol, mineralocorticoids like aldosterone, sex hormones like androgens, estrogens, progestins. Cholesterol is also a precursor for the biosynthesis of bile acids and bile salts. So having all these functions, important functions in mind, uh, it is easy to conclude that the constant concentration of cholesterol is needed to be provided to all cells and tissues. So this maintenance of cholesterol homeostasis is regulated by numerous mechanisms of synthesis, transport, and metabolism regulation. It is also important to, uh, for the organism to prevent the overaccumulation of cholesterol because it's considered, uh, it's uh, thought that cholesterol is one of the major risk factors for the development of atherosclerosis because there are data uh, suggesting that there is uh, a significant percentage of cholesterol uh, in the in the in atherosclerotic uh, atherosclerotic plaques and atherosclerosis 
uh, is the risk factor for the upcoming development of cardiovascular diseases, cerebrovascular diseases. But uh, I, I put a question mark here because there are some uh, data available in some newer researches uh, which actually... Uh, uh, states that cholesterol is not that all bad, that there are some other processes which can contribute to development of atherosclerosis, uh, like inflammation caused by uh, enhanced concentration of glucose molecules and so and so on. But this is going to be the topic for, for some other uh, uh, videos and some other chapters. But let's get back to our cholesterol. So liver uh, plays really a key role in metabolism of cholesterol. Because if you uh, see from, from the figure, uh, there are a couple of major sources of liver cholesterol. Uh, it is dietary cholesterol. We saw it. It can be uh, digested. Uh, cholesterol esters can be digested to cholesterol. Cholesterol can be absorbed to enterocytes. And in enterocytes, we have the uh, formation of helomicron particles, which are secreted to blood, uh, they catabolize in blood, and helomicron remnants are removed from bloodstream and they enter the liver. So, uh, dietary cholesterol is actually uh, transported to the liver. Also, uh, there is a cholesterol from extrahepatic tissues, so which is transported to liver by HDL particles. And we're going to uh, talk about the metabolism of these particles in, in a separate upcoming lecture. Um, also, uh, we have the de novo uh, synthesis of endogenous cholesterol in liver because we mentioned that liver is the major organ for cholesterol synthesis. So uh, in the liver, we have uh, some kind of unique reservoir or pool of liver cholesterol from where uh, cholesterol can be exported in different ways. So it can be exported uh, as a free cholesterol to bile and then to in intestine, intestine and then is secreted or excreted from the body in feces. It can also be converted to bile acids and bile salts, and we're going to talk about these pathways today as well. It can also be packed in the form of VLDL particles and secreted to systemic circulation. And in systemic circulation, these particles can be converted to LDL particles, which are actually the major carriers of cholesterol for peripheral cells and tissues. But we're going to talk about that in much more detail late, later on in some separate lectures. Uh, speaking about uh, concrete... Uh, uh, catabolism of cholesterol like we did for glucose, like we did for fatty acids, uh, there are no enzyme systems available for degradation of that steroid ring. So uh, cholesterol can be catabolized or excreted from the body only in the form of pure cholesterol or in the form of bile acids and bile salts. And we're going to uh, talk about it uh, by the end of this lecture. Uh, speaking of the biosynthesis of cholesterol, the major precursor for biosynthesis is acetylcoenzyme A, which is obtained uh, in cells in sufficient amounts in mitochondria from different metabolic pathways, and now we know them very well, oxidative decarboxylation of pyruvate or beta oxidation of fatty acids, or uh, catabolism of ketogenic amino acid leucine and lysine. Uh, we know that acetylcoenzyme A is transported, has to be transported from mitochondria to cytosol because the biosynthesis of cholesterol occurs in cytosol and all enzymes of the biosynthetic pathways are a pathway are located in the cytosol. So we are going to use the same mechanism and the same three carboxylate shuttle system like we did for the biosynthesis of fatty acids. So I'm not going to go into details all over again. Uh, of course, for the biosynthesis, we need a, low, a large number of reducing equivalents and those are going to be provided by NADPH coenzyme, which is obtained from the hexose monophosphate pathway like we already discussed in previous, uh, in previous videos. Of course, for the biosynthesis, uh, for anabolic pathways, we 
usually require an energy in the form of ATP. Uh, the whole biosynthetic pathway occurs in cytosol from the first to the last reaction, and there are several stages of biosynthesis. The first stage is synthesis of mevalonate from acetyl coenzyme A. So uh, this is the uh, we can say that this is the major regulatory stage of cholesterol biosynthesis. And this is uh, the stage which is very similar to the biosynthesis of ketone bodies, which is going to be our next topic. But the difference is that the cholesterol biosynthesis occurs in cytosol, but the biosynthesis of ketone bodies occurs in mitochondria. So uh, enzymes are the same but they are active in different compartments or we can say that those are isoenzyme forms of certain enzymes so the first reaction reaction number one as you can see from the figure is condensation of two molecules of acetyl coenzyme a to give the molecule of aceto acetyl uh, coenzyme A. The reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme acetyl coenzyme A, acetyl coenzyme A theolase, and uh, the energy for the formation of the new carbon uh, carbon bond is obtained by the hydrolysis of thioester bond, which is, if you remember, high energy bond. So one coenzyme A is released from this system. Uh, the second reaction is uh, condensation of uh, Aceto acetyl coenzyme A with one more acetyl coenzyme A, the third coenzyme A, to give beta hydroxy beta methyl glutaryl coenzyme A or HMG coenzyme A. And the reaction is catalyzed by HMG coenzyme A synthase. Uh, the chemical mechanism of this reaction is aldol condensation, in which uh, the first uh, the carbon atom uh, of the methyl group uh, of acetyl coenzyme A actually reacts with beta carbonyl group of aceto acetyl A, uh, forming the beta hydroxy HMG coenzyme A. Uh, the third reaction of this uh, stage is uh, reduction of HMG coenzyme A to form mevalonate. And actually, uh, if you can see from this figure, Theoester group is uh, hydrolyzed and reduced to alcoholic hydroxyl group. So this reaction, uh, very reaction of the first stage, is a committed reaction of the pathway or committed step, and its main rate limiting step of the pathway. The uh, reaction is catalyzed by HMG red coenzyme A reductase, which is a major regulatory enzyme and it is an enzyme embedded in the membrane of endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, reducing equivalents for this reduction are normally provided by NADPH coenzyme. Mevalonate is now the intermediate which can be subjected to further chemical transformation in the next stage of uh, cholesterol biosynthesis, and that is the conversion of mevalonate to two activated isoprenoid units. This stage actually uh, is composed of several subsequent phosphorylation reactions of mevalonate, and the purpose and the major aim of these phosphorylations are to, is to activate carbon number 5 and carbon number 3 of mevalonate and to get it ready for the formation of isoprenoid unit. For these phosphorylations, ATP is required. Actually, three molecules of ATP are used for phosphorylation. So if you take a look at the figure, the first phosphorylation is completed at the position number five to form phosphomevalonate. And the enzyme catalyzing this reaction is mevalonate 5 phosphotransferase. Then we have the addition of one other, the second phosphate group, again at the carbon atom number five. So we have uh, the formation of five pyrophosphate mevalonate, and the reaction is catalyzed by phosphomevalonate kinase. The third ATP is used for phosphorylation of OH group at the position number three in order to get 3-phosphor-5-pyrophosphate mevalonate. 
and this is very important uh, stage of these uh, reaction of this stage because at this point OH group is activated so the removal of one molecule of water is going to be enabled and the removal of carbon dioxide in the upcoming reaction so we have decarboxylation and we have dehydration uh, followed by the formation of double bond and the formation of a five carbon molecule activated unit which is called isopentanyl pyrophosphate so this is an active uh, isoprenoid unit which is going to be the starting point for the next stage of several subsequent condensations but for the next stage we need one more activated molecule which is actually nothing else but the isomer of isopentanyl pyrophosphate and that is dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate so isomerization is completed by isopentanyl pyrophosphate isomerase those two intermediates isopentanyl pyrophosphate and dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate are going to react uh, uh, between themselves in the first part of the next stage of cholesterol biosynthesis but these two molecules are also important starting points for uh, biosynthesis of coenzyme Q and dolichol as well so I have already introduced you to the next stage now uh, dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate and isopentanyl pyrophosphate are gonna uh, condensate to form um, molecules with uh, more carbon atoms and the aim of this is to get the squalene linear molecule containing 30 carbon atoms so if those molecules are activated five carbons molecule so uh, that means that we're gonna condensate six activated five carbon isoprenoid units in order to get squalene molecule and this is achieved by the following reaction in the reaction number one we have had to tail condensation of dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate with isopentanyl pyrophosphate where head refers to this pyrophosphate group and tail refers to the hydrocarbon chain so as a result of this condensation we get the geronyl pyrophosphate which is a molecule containing 10 carbon atoms Reaction is catalyzed by enzyme prenyl transferase or farnesyl pyrophosphate synthase. In the second reaction, we have condensation of geronyl pyrophosphate with one more molecule of isopentanyl pyrophosphate in order to form farnesyl pyrophosphate 15 carbon atom molecule. The same enzyme catalyzes this second reaction as well and the third reaction is actually condensation of two farnesyl pyrophosphate molecule uh, by the uh, rearrangement head to head and followed by the removal of one pyrophosphate group an enzyme is called squalene synthase and it's NADP requ uh, required or NADP dependent enzymes so we get the squalene molecule which is 30 carbon linear molecule which is ready for the upcoming third stage of cholesterol biosynthesis this third stage actually uh, is nothing else but cyclization of squalene to form lanosterol and finally cholesterol this cyclization is accomplished by the addition of single oxygen from molecular oxygen in order to form epoxide like presented here in the figure NADPH coenzymes are used for reduction of the second oxygen in order to form the molecule of water and the enzyme catalyzing the formation of this 2,3 epoxide is called squalene monoxygenase from squalene 2,3 epoxide cyclization reactions occur which are gonna yield the formation of the steroid structure with four condensed ring in the structure so lanosterol is the first intermediate uh, having this very characteristic sterone ring 
then lanosterol undergoes a series of rather complex reactions in which double bond is going to be removed, some carbon atoms removed, some other double bonds formed in order to get the cholesterol as the final product. Uh, we mentioned that two-thirds of cholesterol are actually esterified, and esterification can be completed inside the cell, so we can have intracellular esterification or intravascular esterification. Intracellular esterification is completed by the enzyme acyl coenzyme A cholesterol acyl transferase, and this is the reaction um, catalyzed by ACAT enzyme. So activated fatty acid, fatty acyl coenzyme A uh, go, enters the reaction with cholesterol and uh, fatty, acyl, uh, fatty acyl or uh, fatty acid residue is attached to hydroxyl group of cholesterol forming cholesterol ester and coenzyme A is released from the system. Intravascular esterification is completed by one other enzyme, LCAT, lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase, and this enzyme is active in the so-called reverse transport of cholesterol completed by HDL particles, but more details about this transport in some of the upcoming videos. Uh, the difference is that in this case, esterification is completed, uh, but uh, no need uh, without the need to activate the fatty acid. So cholesterol esters, which are formed by esterification, are even more hydrophobic molecules than free cholesterol, and. Uh, these cholesterol esters are now um, packed into VLDL particles uh, in liver and then they are secreted to blood. And as I've mentioned, uh, they metabolize to form LDL particles and then LDL particles are actually major carriers and suppliers of cholesterol to peripheral tissues and cells. Cholesterol biosynthesis is regulated uh, primarily uh, upon the control of de novo synthesis of cholesterol and to a lesser extent uh, the regulation of uh, metabolism of dietary cholesterol. This regulation is achieved by three different mechanisms. Uh, the first mechanism is actually regulation of activity and concentration of the major regulatory enzyme HMG coenzyme reductase, and I'm going to explain this in a little bit more details in a minute, but just to mention other mechanisms. Also, uh, biosynthesis of cholesterol can be regulated by uh, the regulation of uh, ACAT activity, which is... Um, uh, completed by uh, very well-known phosphorylation, dephosphorylation processes and covalent modifications of the enzyme, and it's usually, uh, it usually belongs to so-called long-term control systems. And the third mechanism, which I'm going to just list here, and we're going to discuss about it later on in the metabolism of lipoproteins, that is the regulation of the synthesis of LDL receptors. LDL receptors are specific receptors which uh, role is to overtake uh, the cholesterol from systemic circulation. So, uh, when there is a, a lot of cholesterol, increased concentrations of cholesterol inside the cell, it's going to be a signal to decrease the synthesis of LDL cholesterol and then to lesser the overtake of cholesterol from systemic circulation. And of course, you have the opposite situation. But I'm going to get back uh, to this uh, first mechanism of regulation, and that is the regulation of the activity of HMG coenzyme A reductase. And again, uh, like we saw for, for uh, fatty acids, oxidation and biosynthesis, we have short-term and long-term regulation. So speaking of short-term regulation, um, HMG coenzyme reductase can be 
regulated allosterically by mevalonate and cholesterol uh, by the principle of competitive inhibition. Also, this enzyme can be, can be subjected to covalent modifications and those are uh, those famous phosphorylation, dephosphorylation processes uh, which are actually subjected to hormonal regulation. And this is explained uh, in the figure and it's very similar to the regulation of glycogen synthase, to the regulation of uh, uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase system. It's very similar to the regulation of fatty acid synthase and so on. So uh, the mechanism is the same and now I'm not going to go into details explaining all over again uh, the regulation by G protein, activation of adenylacyclase, accumulation of CAMP. Uh, but the point is that uh, it activates uh, the cascade of phosphorylations. So uh, let's explain it just in brief. Glucagon or sterols are activators of AMP activated protein kinase, which is active when phosphorylated. This AMP activated protein kinase actually phosphorylates HMG coenzyme A reductase, which becomes inactive. So uh, in case of the uh, insufficient amounts of energy, and we know that AMP is a signal for it. Uh, AMP activated protein kinase kinase is going to be activated, so it's going to phosphorylate AMP activated protein kinase in order to activate it. So the activated protein kinase it's going to phosphorylate uh, HMG coenzyme reductase and inactivate it, so it's going to stop the cholesterol biosynthesis, which is logically. Uh, glucagon uh, is a response of the lack of energy. It's a response of lack of acetyl coenzyme A. So as a, as a consequence of this, cholesterol biosynthesis is going to inhibit it, is going to be inhibited. On the other side, insulin as an antagonist to glucagon is going to activate phosphatase, specific phosphatase, which is going to dephosphorylate HMG coenzyme A reductase, thus activating it and directing uh, the cholesterol uh, biosynthetic pathway in the direction of uh, promoting cholesterol biosynthesis. And all of these uh, achieved by the mechanism that we have already explained in previous chapters. Speaking about the long-term regulation, it's based on the uh, control of the synthesis of those enzymes by the feedback mechanism with the final products of the biosynthetic pathway, I mean uh, by the cholesterol itself. So also cholesterol can affect some transcriptional factors uh, which uh, then uh, have a significant effect on gene expression and the biosynthesis of enzymes involved in the cholesterol biosynthesis. Uh, but now let's move on to uh, excretion of cholesterol. So I have already mentioned that, that there are no enzymes available for the degradation of a steran ring, uh, but the only uh, way to catabolize cholesterol is to convert it to bile acids or bile salts. So uh, during the biosynthesis of bile acids and salt, the first reaction is uh, the main regulatory reaction, and that is the uh, hydroxylation at 7-alpha position. Alpha means below the, the steran ring. So it's uh, the incorporation of 7-alpha hydroxyl group so hydroxyl group at alpha or of alpha orientation at carbon 7 of steran ring. Reaction is completed by 7-alpha hydroxylase, which is, of course, the main regulatory enzyme of the pathway. Uh, this enzyme is inhibited by the increased concentration of bile salts in cells and in the organism. Uh, after this first rate-limiting reaction, uh, there are some other reactions occurring. Uh, one of these reactions is the reduction of the double bond in the B-ring, so this double bond and carbon number 5 is reduced, and we may or may not have some additional hydroxylation in order to get 
two sets of compounds. So if we have uh, hydroxyl groups at position 3, 7, and 12, then we have the series of holic acids. If we have OH group only at positions 3 and 7, we have henodeoxyholic series of bile acids. Notice that both groups in both series have carboxyl group in the structure. And the pK of these uh, bile acids is approximately 6. So having in mind that the pH of intestinal lumen is also approximately 6, which means that um, approximately 50% of bile acids are in ionized form. Uh, synthesized bile acids or bile salts are stored and concentrated in the gallbladder and then discharged into the gut uh, as a result of the presence of food in duodenum, uh, especially in the presence of lipids and proteins. Uh, you, we already know that uh, these bile acids and salts are used for emul chemical emulsification and formation of micelles in the process of absorption of products of lipid digestion in the form and in the ways we have already explained in previous chapters. Uh, those bile acids and salts can be additionally modified or conjugated uh, in the way that carboxyl group is activated by coenzyme A and ATP in the way fatty acids are activated. And then activated carboxylic group can be conjugated either with glycine or taurine uh, to get glycoholic or glycohenol deoxyholic acid with a pk4 uh, which means that this uh, conjugated bile acids are more ionized than unconjugated bile acids thus uh, more functional more effective than uh, deconjugated bile acids uh, when conjugated with taurine we get tauroholic or taurohenodeoxyholic with a pk2 i'm sorry for this mistake with a pk2 which means that they are even more ionized and even more effective as emulsifiers than unconjugated bile acids uh, what can we also say uh, when these bile acids uh, are found in uh, intestine in intestine in uh, large intestine uh, they undergo and they can be subjected to uh, the action of intestinal bacteria uh, during this process bacteria can um, deconjugate those bile acids and dehydroxylate those bile acids to form the group of so-called secondary bile acids so there are two uh, secondary bile, uh, bile salts or bile acids, are, those are deoxyholic acid or lithoholic acid. Uh, what, why is this important? Uh, when uh, those uh, bile salts are deconjugated or, uh, and dehydroxylated, uh, their polarity decreases, so their solubility decreases, which means that uh, those uh, molecules are not going to be reabsorbed uh, from the intestinal lumen, so they're going to be uh, much poorly uh, reabsorbed than the salts that uh, were not subjected to bacterial action. So lithoholic acid, actually as a secondary bile salt, has, as you can see from the figure here, hydroxyl group only at the position number three. So, and this one is the least soluble bile salt. And this is the major fate, uh, and the major fate of lithoholic acid is its excretion not reabsorption. And to conclude this story, uh, let me give you some of the data regarding those bile acids. So uh, approximately more than 95% of bile salts are uh, reabsorbed uh, in the ileum and returned to the liver by enterohepatic circulation. Uh, 
the secondary uh, bile salts on the other side uh, they are reconjugated uh, they can be reconjugated in the liver but they uh, cannot be rehydroxylated in the liver so uh, actually those uh, bile acids and bile salts are uh, secreted into the bile and this enterohepatic recirculation of bile uh, salts is extremely efficient so in in, in uh, the end uh, less than five percent of bile salts uh, entering the gut is excreted in feces each day uh, because the steroid nucleus to conclude the story uh, cannot be degraded in the body and i have mentioned it a couple of times so far the excretion of bile salts actually serves as the major route of removal of the steroid nucleus and cholesterol in the body. Uh, so more or less, uh, that was uh, all what you should know about the uh, cholesterol metabolism, about the uh, biosynthesis of cholesterol, about its conversion to bile acids and about its excretion from the body. Uh, until uh, some ne some other next topic uh, stay healthy stay safe and bye bye